Hi everybody, my name is Alan and on behalf of the crew I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. <coughs> you know, it's interesting, uh, today was an unusual day, I've been feeling it coming on for about a week or so, but it was interesting that today I think there's going to be a shift, a shift in the momentum, a shift a away from division, away from separation, away from conflict, into a momentum of, of, of love, of connectedness, of collaboration. Today we're filming in Santa Barbara, October 23rd, 1998, and today people and people and leaders and peoples who have basically fought for, I guess, thousands of years seem to have come to some sort of resolution. People who seem to feel that hate and hatred were better than love and, and consciousness. But today they shook hands. I mean, when I saw that on t TV with uh, Arafat and Netanyahu shaking hands, and then they shook this way, then they went into the other handshake. I thought they were doing some, you know, Boy Scout thing. I mean, it was really, it was, you know, and then it was just an extraordinary experience. And, and what we've been seeing around lately is that that shift is starting to happen, and that shift is starting to happen with more velocity. And our guests tonight are examples of that and, and helpers in that and helping the shift and helping the momentum grow to bring us into an experience of love, of oneness, to recognize that there is only one, one power, one love, one creator, one energy that, that is us all. And we're all brothers and sisters here in this experiment of love on planet Earth. And, and I can see that happening more and more, and I'm just so delighted to be part of that and to welcome the people we have tonight to share with you. We have Ramana, who is an extraordinary being, and he's uh, the developer of a radical awakening process. And we'll, we'll talk to him about what awakens, how it happens, what his process was to come to that awakening, and how it helps propel him and all those who experience that into more and more experiences of love and connectedness. And we also have with us uh, Lauren Green, who's been with us before. She's an old friend of ours, and we're just delighted to have her back with us again. She's a master harpist, and she's a singer-songwriter, and we're just so, so happy and pleased to have Ramana and Lauren with us tonight. So as we normally do at this time, join me in a short meditation. But remember, we're going to go right out of the meditation into Lauren's first set, which is Love Goes On, and it's words and music by uh, Paul Brady, and it's going to be performed by Lauren Green. So right out of the meditation, we're going to go right to that. So please join me in a short meditation. Thank you. People like us, we search the sky at night, waiting for stars to fall. Holding our breath, and hoping our turn will come, waiting to hear the call. Time after time, we 
seem to stand in line Year after endless year Wondering if The moment has passed us by And where do we go from here? Dreams may come and go Dreams may come and go Things may hurt us so But why should we be afraid As long as we know Wherever we go Love goes on All of the time, rain or come shine, love goes on. You and me here, with nothing to fear, when love goes on, on and on. People like us We know the sky at night Is only a day away Stars will come out This time our chance may come Tomorrow could be the day may come and go dreams may come and go but I still love you so there's nothing to stop us now as long as we know wherever we go love goes on Rain or come shine All of the time Love goes on You and me here With nothing to fear When love goes on On and on Thank you, Lauren. That was beautiful. So we're on the set with Ramana. So like Lauren was saying, love goes on and you can experience it. What, what is it about this human experiment of humans that prevents humans from having that experience of the love that, that they really are, the love, just the love? What do, what do you think that is? Well, I think that you can point to a lot of uh, outside kind of influences like early childhood and the kind of the environment that we're growing up in. I think it's easy to get caught up in that kind of thing, though. And uh, instead of looking at it in terms of, well, in transpersonal psychology, the early transpersonal theorists said that the problem really is not, a, uh, is not inherent in the content of the material that, of the mind that creates these kinds of things, but really a, uh, a case of mistaken identity that one thinks that one is this, this person that's caught up in all of these problems. And uh, when I say mistaken identity, if you could take the identity off of that one that is suffering with all the problems and see oneself in a different viewpoint, then in a way those kinds of um, pullings and tuggings of those tendencies of that personality that one 
who had previously falsely identified themselves with, uh, those tendencies have a tendency of falling away. Maybe not all at once, but over time, uh, there is kind of an awakening that can take place of uh, the nature of one's true uh, being. So in other words, like we're, we're kind of like rising above a maze. We're in the maze and we feel the suffering, and if, if we can have an experience of being above it, we're not so affected by it? Yeah. I think we even have to take a step further back. Because, uh, Alan, I think that what you're talking about is like a, a, a witness position. Oftentimes the Buddhists will talk about this creating this, this, this neutral observer or this witness. And yet the neutral observer still is a person, uh, is still an I. It's still a, a central location. So that, uh, of course, that even in psychotherapy, for instance, uh, it's useful to get out of the problem that one is in to step back and look at it. So mm -hmm. that is useful. I do have mm -hmm. to say it's useful. But what I'm really talking about is something different than just a witness position or standing or being above and seeing from below is what I'm really talking about is when I'm talking about identifying uh, with one's true nature is to see oneself as who, as who one really is. And that is no central location at all. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you talk about awakening, you mean awakening to that experience. When you talk about a ra radical awakening process, that's the awakening that you would hope people have and at some point you had, right? The awakening <coughs> is awakening to one's true nature. And it really happens at a level of, of knowing, at a very fundamental level. Because if you're looking for an experience, I mean, I think that all of us have had experiences of, uh, or at least many of us have had experiences of, of, of peace, of oneness, of knowing who one is. Maybe it happened in nature in a quiet moment, maybe in a deep meditation maybe through some, um, uh, some experiences of, uh, of native uh, indigenous cultures, shamanic practices, where you had a sense of all of a sudden something really opens up. And you do lose this kind of sense of this identity that we are, that's kind of secular and small and mm -hmm. provincial, and opening up to something much larger. And yet what I'm talking about is, is that is still an experience. And that's, I think, where a lot of us are caught we have these experiences of really opening up and knowing oneself, and then it turns into a memory. And then we have this I, the same person that kind of created the problem in the first place, this identification, this person that's trying to get something, to do something better, to, uh, to somehow get some kind of practice or some kind of meditation or something that we can do that we can somehow recapture that experience. So what I'm talking about is out of the whole set, completely out of the set of this, one, this, uh, this person that's trying to do something. So it's almost like beyond the practice. It's an experience of something that's an ongoing... It's even beyond experience because experiences come and go. I mean, you notice, there's yeah. probably days that you feel great and all of a sudden you feel connected. Mm -hmm. Other days you feel like, oh, well, this is like nothing's working for me. And you start questioning everything that you start doing. What I'm ta so that's the realm of experience. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of the cycle that most of us are caught in. Mm -hmm. Caught in this, the experience of when, when it's good, it's good. And when it isn't, it isn't. And somehow the spiritual path is about trying to get it good all the time. See, the problem, again, is not inherent in the content of the what that one is doing. The problem lies in the identification there is somebody actually here trying to do something. The case, as I said, as we opened up the program with, is a false identification of who one is. So, and your process brings you into a true identification. experience. It's a touching into something. It's a recognition. And it only takes a moment to really... I have a whole weekend uh, intensive where, uh, where there's an awakening where one sees who one is. It only takes a moment. But I spend 14 hours setting the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. And once one 
sees who one's, one is truly and sees the face of one's true nature, and this is the test, if anybody's wondering about if they've really done that or not, is that you don't forget that, that there's never a question uh, that this self-inquiry process, which is an established practice in India, the process or the, uh, or the practice of self-inquiry, and true self-inquiry, you only need to ask yourself that question, who am I once? Once you see that face, you never have to ask that again. That's the shift in a radical awakening. It's something that's stable throughout all experiences, and it lives in the realm of knowing. And how did you first come to that experience? By grace. I think that's how it happens with all of us. Um, grace came in the form for me of my teacher uh, right over here, uh, H.W.L. Punja, affectionately, we all affectionately know him as, um, as Papaji. He, li- he, was in, he died last September but gave satsangs, or gatherings, of people who are awakening the truth of who they are. And it really happened, and again, for me, it was just one moment. What I did was I was about, maybe this close to him as we're about as close as we, we are with each other right now, looking to each other's eyes very much as we are looking into them. Mm-hmm. And what happened is, is when I looked into his eyes, I saw a very, very vast universe. It was bigger than anything that I've ever seen before and experienced. It's almost like I fell into those eyes, and I got lost. And the universe that I fell into totally absorbed me to this one that I called previously Yukio. Disappeared. He wasn't there anymore. And there was this this breathing, living consciousness that I was that seemed to span everywhere that included everything. It was in a moment of realization that I realized that what I was looking at was not a vast universe, not a incredible experience of like who I was, because there was no one there to experience it, but what I really got in the realization that as I was looking into my teacher's eyes, that I saw myself. And everything. Which is everything. everything. And it's almost like it's not really everything, like there are things here. Uh, it is and it isn't. It's like the stuff that it's all made out of, mm-hmm. the stuff that it's all composed of. One way of looking at it is, is as if uh, who we are is the substratum of everything that exists. And it's like a blank movie screen. And what we're, we're playing this little movie right here on camera, it will look uh, to the people who are watching this, um, lines and dots on a screen. What if the lines and the dots on the screen were not just on the television, but was just what was happening right here? And who we were, or who we are, is existing as this movie screen. So as the movie screen, notice how the fire on a movie screen, after the, after the movie's over, the screen's not burned. Uh, there's people swimming the screen is not wet. So in that way, who you are is not touched in that way. It could be fully experienced. I mean, when you're in a movie, it's like, hmm, it's all really there, just like Mm -hmm. in a dream. It's all very real. And yet, when all of the dust settles, or the mind settles, you find that there is this screen that has been untouched the whole time. And did you find in your life that when when you had that awakening moment, Mm -hmm. that although you knew what awakening was, that it stayed with you on a consistent level, or was it just like rubbing up against a magnet (laughs) and then getting more and more? Yeah. Papaji was definitely had a lot of energy. In fact, uh, there's a lineage, uh, although he would never use that word lineage, but I see it as a transmission that first came from his teacher over here. Sri Ramana Maharshi, who was considered to be one of India's greatest saints, who died um, in the early 50s. There was a definite transmission that took place, and it's a transmission that is real contagious, real contagious. And it was transferred to my teacher Papaji, and then transferred to me. 
and then but I it was did. transferred to others. I mean, there were others in there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean. Well, anybody. Something interesting happened when he died. I was in a. Um, Which one? Uh, when Papaji died last September, September sixth. I was with a group of people who were watching a movie of his. Um, it was about 300 of us. It was kind of a memorial service for him in America. And every one of them, we had this kind of sharing afterwards, and it seemed to be consensus that everybody got a piece of his awareness that was like a little germ, like a virus in a computer mm -hmm. that just like starts growing. growing. Uh -huh. So even after that awakening experience you had, which was before that, this came and like propelled it even further or, or helped spark it even more, would you say? It's, it's one, something that one has to be careful of. Because which, what does one have to be careful? Well, of these experiences. Because you get these tremendous hits of the self, and you start thinking that that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So then, once you start thinking that's what it is, you start running into the problem of, well, I'm it when I'm experiencing it, right. and I'm not when I'm not experiencing it. So there's something much deeper, which is a knowing that I started talking about before. So yes, the experiences definitely have deepened, have increased. There seems to be a natural, spontaneous and natural um, deepening into this awareness. But that comes in the realm of experience. One thing that hasn't left is the knowing. The experiences come and go. Mm -hmm. I have, like you, good days and bad days. But there's something that's stable and something that is inherent, inherently in everything, which is who we all are. And that's something that is ever-present. And your process, was, it, was your process taught to you by your teachers? Oh. So was that part of the, the training or part of, hmm. and we're using words, so yes, I mean, yes. part of whatever, you know, came down, or was yeah. that after the, the mm -hmm. transmission on, yes. at the movie, or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that little piece that she got, was that the, the radical uh, process? Yeah, or? yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. Um, I try to be fair as best <laughs> I can. <laughs> I came from the background of, uh, uh, of being uh, a transpersonal psychotherapist. And in transpersonal psychotherapies, there's a lot of experiential things that, that seem to move a, a client into this oneness or love or, or a knowing space. Um, so when I watched Papaji work, there were two levels that happened. There was one level that there was nothing going on at all except a straight, direct transmission that was in silence. And uh, this is a report of many people who both come to my satsangs, people who um, who have been to satsangs uh, with uh, Papaji, which is that their mind becomes silent, and it's almost like a jamming frequency. I spent a number of months this uh, uh, this last year at the Sri Ramana Ashram in southern India, and the air around there was thick with silence. It was literally a jamming signal of the mind. When the mind drops away, what exists? what is right. just arises naturally. Right. So that is what it's like. And when I watched Papaji work, I saw at one level that that's all that was going on. At another level, I saw a very incredible hypnotherapist. I saw a very, I saw a master hypnotist. I saw a master of words. I saw a master of, of mood and environment and technique. And I observed that and watched that and learned from it. And there were definitely patterns, mm -hmm. definite patterns that he was doing that I adapted in my radical awakening process. But still it's spontaneous for you because you're a living consciousness, right? Yeah, every moment is that way actually, not just in a process. Yeah, it could be no other way except you're, you're, you're in recognition of it. It's yes. a way to describe it. Yes, yes, yes. I feel like what I really do is invite people into the consciousness of m and awareness of my teachers. And, c and can you do that in groups of thousands, or do you do it one-on-one? -on -one? What is seemingly the preferable, or the way that works best, or <laughs> least? Or, <you> know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I keep hearing stories from people, uh, of people who have come to my satsangs, who come to a weekend, that, that all these time bombs go off, that I have no idea what's going on. I don't really feel like it's an interesting thing. 
I've been recently feeling like I'm um, that I'm more of a function than 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 a person. Mm -hmm. That I um, that there's this thing that kind of happens around me, and um, it doesn't seem to be uh, under any kind of volitional personal control of mine. So, um, in a way, I've kind of surrendered. So you that have to surrender to be a function. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can still eat, though. It's yeah, like I can it's still, still eat. Still in a human body. I still get hungry. I right. still like chocolate ice cream. Right. <laughs> I understand. So, so that's like an interesting process for you to be going through. Oh yeah. So, at some point, it became like you know you were doing this, and then all of a sudden, it was like it was being done. It was being done around you. Really, in a absolutely. Sense. I had a lot of like plans and ideas and. Um, my teacher, Papaji, he um, gave me the name of his own teacher, uh, Ramana, Sri Ramana Maharshi, which I thought was an incredible blessing and in a way a curse, I thought at first. It's like, how am I going to live up to... Yeah, if you to, think it's going to be a to, blessing, yeah. it's going to be in the duality. If you yeah. think about something, it's got to have both sides. In my mind played with that, too. Right. I'm thinking, how am I going to... He, he gave me the instruction to live and teach his Ramana. I mean, the guy was like India's greatest saint. I'm just about the farthest thing from a saint that you can get. Well, we won't get into that. <laughs> and plus, we got, you know, Ramana's picture on it, so <laughs> we'll leave that one. All right, maybe, maybe now is a good time to take a break and hear uh, Lauren set. Uh, a stranger from the prairie, uh, she's going to perform it, and the words and music by a local poet, Enid Osborne. And then also she's going to do Hidden Heart, uh, written and performed by Lauren. That's going to be an instrumental. And then we'll come back and talk more about the radical awakening process with Ramana. So uh, I'm just excited to hear Lauren again. So Lauren, whenever you're ready. I have no fear for the sea I am a stranger from the prairie And when the first shell spoke to my ear I was a free child of the Pecos Valley And the shell she was a sensuous pink lady Singing Baba Himayo Siana Gaya Singing Baba Himayo Siana Gaya My mama showed her to me Ma wore the dust of running horses The shell was from her, her grandmama Her papa living in the roses And her two tall and school lemon trees And poppies in their backyard and they'd stay up in the evenings to smell the ocean air and count the stars. But she wouldn't give an arrowhead for all of California. Mama wouldn't give an arrowhead for all of California. Singing bye-bye, my Oceana Gaia. Singing bye-bye, my Oceana Gaia. And now, I live by the sea You may be lonely Mama told me Oh California Brushing by How many times You bought and sold me But my love and I Grow lavender And poppies In our backyard And we walk upon the Look out to the sea, 
when I grow tired And the sea she is my bounteous blue prairie oh, oh, Singing bye-bye, my Oceana Gaia Singing bye-bye, my Oceana Gaia Singing bye-bye I give uh, great thanks to Enid Osborne for writing such beautiful lyrics and, and such a beautiful melody. This is Hidden Heart.
Hi, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. So we're back with Ramana. So is there any way we could do something experiential on the set, you know, to oh, like... Oh, okay. Um, would have to be something short, I understand, because yeah, of the time. Right. Let's see what... Uh, well, you know, I'd like to address something. There's a lot of, uh, in the new age, there's a lot of things that we hear, and we all kind of take it for granted, like, Yes, we're all one, and we all are experiencing th as things as one, and we are love, and we are awareness, and we hear these things, and we can all, we can all nod our heads with about those things, but I really wonder if you could really get the impact of what that really means, the implications of we are one, what that really means. I mean, if we are all one, we're not saying that we're just one with one another. I mean, I'm sure that's in there. But if we really are one with everything, that means that we are one with the little ant that's crawling into, a, into an anthill right now, you know, underneath the studio. We are the fisherman on the other side of the world that's just getting up right now to do his morning fishing. We're the man in death row waiting for his sentence. We are the black hole that is sucking up a whole entire solar system right now. We are the sun that's novaing out somewhere in some galaxy that's burning up all the planets. We are the Milky Way that's moving at thousands of miles per hour through space, that we're all of that. And I'm just wondering experientially if we can, instead of having the words, we are all one, just be words, to actually be able to bring in the awareness that really, uh, what I call it, non-local awareness. Local awareness is like, is in this body, in this head, in the mind, processing everything. What if you were to take awareness to be, we really are one. You and I are one, and you are one with everything. So experientially, right now, and maybe other people could try this with us, if you can get the idea right now that you are not only this body that's sitting here listening to me, but you are that ant, that you are that fisherman, that you are the sun that's going around the planet, the, excuse me, the sun that, is, that we're circling right now. We are, and you are, the entire universe from the far ends to farther than your mind can possibly ever fathom. And to just stop dropping away right now of local awareness and opening up to everything that you are this moment. And then, to get the idea that that body that's sitting there right now is just something that's being used. It's just part of the creation, no different than this glass of water. But somehow it's channeling through that body right now, so that it's now using those eyes to see right now. That it, all, everything that is, is now listening through those ears. Tell me if you get a sense of your perceptics changing, your perceptions changing at all as a result of like this non-local awareness. You can give me a report of what you're well, I, I don't really have a local awareness generally, so but I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's natural, fairly natural to me. But I, I experience it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's add something Go. to this now. We had the experience of non-local awareness of like moving through that body, through those eyes. Now, what I'd like you to do is to turn that awareness the other way instead of going flowing through this way, that your attention goes the other way, 
back. Would you? Would the process include uh, closing my eyes? Uh, it could be. It doesn't matter. You can imagine, though, that a mirror is coming in front of you. And in, in awareness, the pure awareness that you are, that is everything, is now looking, instead of out here, is looking back at itself and seeing itself. So that that awareness becomes aware of itself existing that it awakens to its own existence. Yeah, good, that's it. So when you allow the perceiver, the awareness, to see itself, what is, what is seen, what's there? Is that a question? Yes, yes, I want you to look. I want you to look. To, and let me give you just a few more quick instructions. When I snap my finger, we're going to have one second, or maybe even a, qu a quarter of a second. For that quarter of a second, I want you to stop your mind. That's doable in a quarter of a second, it really is. Maybe two or three seconds is kind of tough, but a quarter of a second is always there to do this. To stop all mind, to stop all thinking, to stop all desiring for one quarter of a second so everything gets quiet. For that one quarter of a second, we have a small window to put that mirror in front so that you get a direct experience without past history, without desires, without thought. You have one split second to look back and see the perceiver so that the awareness is, can see itself. When I snap my finger, I want you to do that. And when you do that, I want you to tell me what it is that gets perceived. Okay, right now, stop my mind and look back. Find out what is there. Perception is going backwards to so that which is the perceiver now sees itself. So what's there? I would describe it as light. Mm -hmm. Now look, I'm going to snap my fingers one more time, and I want you to look beyond the light, to look back even further, because the light is not the perceiver. Light is something that manifests out of who you are. Mm -hmm. We're going to go another step deeper. When I snap my finger, all mind stops. All desires stop for a quarter of a second and look back even beyond that light. Back mm -hmm. further. Go. Ahead. go. Awareness moves backwards to see itself. more an experience than, than I would say it would be something that's, it would be like, I would describe it as love in a way. Uh -huh. Okay, it's experience of love. So what if then love, that which is the, ex which is perceiving and, and taking in everything, is actually made up of love? That's the stuff. We're, remember I said that you know, we're all, the substratum is everything. Mm -hmm. Now we're finding out what the substratum is actually made of, what the stuff is actually consisting of. It's made up of love. And this is why it is that when you say things like, when you, the Christians will say, God is love. It's not a metaphor. It's a literal thing they're talking about that the everything, all that we all are, is in fact love. So if that's true, we have the greatest, incredible love affair, the greatest, incredible love affair that's possible in all mankind, which is, is that once the beloved, that everything who you are, dances with you and takes as it is, taking over any kind of volition 
or any kind of personal desire of my own. It's like a surrender every moment to that love. And it's the most incredible love affair that one can be in. Would you say that at some point it's like there's no surrender because there's just it? So you're just <laughs> moving through. So there's no, there's no thing to surrender to. There's just love. Yes. Yeah. And that's like a vibration and energy that. Yes. Yeah. Proceeds and takes form. Yes. Very good. And listen to what you're saying because the implications <coughs> of that are great. That there really is all there is is love. That means that there really isn't. I don't want to blow anybody's mind out here, but no, I, I, there's not that many people watching. So <laughs> okay. Don't <worry. laughs> no, don't worry about it. We do it every week, so <laughs> every two weeks. So in some cities, every week, three times a week. Go ahead. That there really isn't anyone out there. That there really and there really isn't anyone in there. Or in there, exactly, right. exactly. So that oftentimes when people will look and see when I direct their attention backwards, what they'll say is what they see is nothing. And they kind of think like nothing, like I'm not really getting this because I'm just getting there's nothing. Not really realizing that they got a direct experience of who they are, which is there, there is nothing. There is just pure awareness as you saw, as love. Sometimes mm -hmm. that pure awareness manifests itself as very deep peace. Right. Or bliss. Satisfaction or bliss. Right. And Everything. Would you call okay that an experience? See, that's when I was talking earlier about an experience of something. See, you know, a lot of times there's, you know, like different word patterns. So, you know, you, I mean, we had uh, Byron Katie on last week who has her own, you know. Yeah, it's true. And she barely speaks, so that was a really interesting interview. You know, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's interesting because if it, Somebody could say what you were describing would be called an experience, yeah. although it's not, but we're using word, you know. No, they are different. It's like they ride in tandem, though, that the knowing of the self rides like this, and it's stable and throughout. Experience goes like this. It's a high experience of knowing oneself. It's like forgetting oneself and getting caught up at work, whatever. It's more like Actually, it's, I, I see it as a sine wave. That's, I've explained it this way sometimes. Is that if you look at a sine wave, um, a sine wave goes has a positive has a positive arc and a negative arc, and a positive arc and a negative arc. There's a line that you can draw through. Now, the interesting thing about that line is when it hits the line, it's not it's neither positive or negative. It is actually nothing. Back down to the negative, hits nothing again. So when you want to look at the con the, um, what's constant throughout that, what you have to acknowledge is the one thing that is constant is nothing. So what I really give people is nothing. You know, it's interesting you say that because I was thinking, at one point I was talking about writing a book becoming nothing. We think <laughs> we want to add on, but actually we want to subtract till what's there is there, and we're not identifying with yeah. all the rest. Of course, the problem with becoming nothing is that there, it implies that there is somebody to become something, which is nothing. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, but once you get there, you realize. You know, it's like, I mean, that's the interesting part of living in a physical form, in a sense, in a duality, because you have to walk the razor's edge, so you're talking about... Yes. So, I mean, it's easy to pick one side and say, well, there's no other side, but there is the other side, and then yes. there's the place in the middle where, yes. you know, the, the, s the central point lives. I call that place where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if that's the... Is that what Papaji calls it? <laughs> I don't think so. You're making, up, you're making it a very American... <laughs> he calls it where the relative and the absolute <laughs> meet. <laughs> that sounds more like the spiritual. <laughs> but but uh, everybody understands yours too, I think. So, so do you find a lot of people, who, you know, more and more people coming and wanting to have that experience? No. No, of course you do. No. So, There isn't a person I found that doesn't want that. That ultimately, when I find out, when we get underneath the parts that, that um, are up to something, of trying to get something, if we subject that or put that one through an inquiry process, we, found out, we find out that every part, every desire, ultimately, is for the union with the beloved. 
and there's a lot of consolations that we do when we don't have that, and there's a lot of seeking and a lot of um, kind of pyrite, kind of fool's gold about you know getting close to it. But mm-hmm. ultimately, I find that there isn't anyone who doesn't really want that ultimately. And there's only one problem in, in the human condition, the human experiment, is not having that experience. All the rest seem like problems, but really there's only one problem, and all the rest kind of derive from not having that that knowing. I would use the word experience, but God forbid I do it again. <laughs> so would it's you a say case, that It's a case of mistaken identity. It's, it's a, case a case of mistaken, of mistaken identity. But until the identity is, is no longer mistaken, then it looks like there are other dilemmas and problems in a human life. Yeah. It's interesting that um, Ramana Maharshi, when he was um, dying of cancer, uh, they asked him, his devotees asked him, um, what does it feel like to have this cancer in your body? And he said, it feels like a hundred scorpions are biting my body right now. And they said, are you suffering? And he said, no. Mm-hmm. Because he knew that what was happening at that point really didn't have much to do with who he really was. In fact, uh, some of his last words were um, before he died. His, uh, his devotees were, of course, crying and, and, and having a lot of grief watching him go. And he asked well, them, Why would they have that if they were having that experience? If he had transmitted that experience to them? How does that work? Because the mind always returns. The mind always returns. The mind always. You see did, this did it return to him? Was he was subject to that same force as far as you could tell? I mean, you weren't in his... The mind does not, as near as I could tell, the mind does not get enlightened. This is really bad news for the mind, <laughs> because the mind really wants something. And yet, when one really realizes the mind cannot get enlightened, there's some kind of freedom that happens around mm-hmm. that. So, So yes. even in that, we can we can mourn the loss, loss of a loved one, in a sense, even though what, you know, it's oneness returning to oneness, yes. love returning to yes. love, and yet we as humans cry and, yet, and feel the loss. Mm-hmm. And yet his, his question was to everybody as, as he was dying was, why are you dying? Why are you oh, crying? Excuse me, why are you crying? I'm dying. You're yes. crying. <laughs> Let's not get this mixed up. Yes. Unless one of you would like to know. <laughs> no, he says, why are you crying? He says, because where do you think that I'm going to go? Right. And these are people who had had his transmission, had experience over and over again. So the dilemma of the human condition is strong. Mind is strong. It's, so, it seems like a powerful force against the experience of love. Or Krishna called it. Krishna love. called it the like a, a team to, talking to Arjuna on the battlefield. Said it was like a team of wild horses that is just dragging you through the bramble and the bush. So, my teacher Papaji says because of the strong tendency of the mind, the only thing you really have is to put your attention on God and love every moment. It's the only chance that you have. Well, I think again, you know the worth. <laughs> almost over with the show and I mean it's just really a, I don't know if you got the feel for what was going on here but there was just really a powerful powerful love and a powerful energy and we're using words again and <laughs> you know everybody has different ways of approaching the words of it but really what we want to have is that knowing of who we really are that surrender to that that experience of that and if anybody wants in, any information we're filming October 23rd uh, Ramana is holding uh, workshops in LA uh, over the weekend, the, the 24th and 25th. You can call me. Uh, Lauren has concerts around. Uh, so call me at 805 687 2053. 805 687 2053. And I'll give you whatever information you need. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank everybody for all the wonderful letters and calls and uh, just beautiful information we're getting from all over. So God bless you. Thank you. Good night.